Dr. J. Chiranjeevi, Director of Seva Bharat, one of the largest mission organizations in the world, shares his personal story. Just want to remind us before we make our declaration this morning uh, that God has given us faith in our hearts and He's given us that authority by which we enforce His work. So when we stand up and make our declaration, we're not just doing something that's part of the Sunday morning service, you know, let's do it, let's move on kind of thing. No, we are here to affirm, to declare what God has done for us in Christ. And uh, the Bible tells us in Philemon, and I'm referring to Philemon chapter 1 verse 6, where Paul writes and he says, I want you to acknowledge every good thing that is in you in Christ Jesus. To acknowledge, to recognize as a fact the good things God has done for us in Christ. And that's so important for us to do. So let's stand up to our feet as we make our declaration. I want you to hold your Bible high up in the air. Let's say this out loud, bold and strong together. This is God's word. This is God speaking to me. I am who God says I am. I can do what God says I can do. I will become everything God has promised. I'm saved, healed, delivered, redeemed. I am blessed, victorious, prosperous, triumphant. I'm a minister of God, a servant of Christ, and a channel of His blessing to many people. I receive His Word, I believe His Word, and I live by His Word. Christ is my Master, and to Him I am in absolute surrender. In Jesus' name, Amen. I request you to please remain standing. This morning, we have the privilege of having Dr. Chiranjeevi to minister to us. The first time I got to meet Dr. Chiranjeevi was in uh, 2012 while we were uh, working together to have this conference in Delhi. Uh, And uh, so that was the first time I got to meet him. He came as a speaker in that big stadium with close to 8,000 young people. And uh, then once again, last year in 2016, we worked closely together. Uh, as we prepared for this second conference in Delhi, uh, the youth conference. And, uh, and that's when I really got to know him, got to hear his story, uh, his journey. And I felt that, you know, we need somebody like him to come and just talk to us and just share with us uh, his own life, his own story, and, and, and things that he's learned. Uh, Dr. Chiranjeevi is the general director of uh, Seva Bharat. Uh, has close to, but I think uh, he'll tell us exactly how many years, but nearly four decades uh, in the ministry. Uh, Seva Bharat as as an organization focused on three areas of ministry. Uh, They have an institute for um, community transformation, training church planters. Uh, They have, secondly, they have an adult literacy. uh, It's the second focus is in adult literacy. And a third area is in uh, children development programs, and they've developed their own curriculum for all of these three areas of ministry. They have several hundred, maybe like a thousand, I don't know the exact number of people working as part of the ministry all across India, and a, and a very strong, very powerful uh, missions work that's happening. He's also the chairman of the Indian Institute of Missiology. So we're just delighted to have somebody like this come and speak to us and stir us up for missions to look beyond our own Church walls. Amen? So let's put our hands together and welcome Dr. Chirinjivi as he comes and ministers to us this morning. Such a privilege and uh, an opportunity and a joy for me and also my colleagues who have accompanied me this morning, uh, Moses Benedict and another coordinator of ours who stay in Bangalore to be with you and enjoy the worship in all people's church. And we want to thank you for welcoming us. And I very specially want to thank Pastor Ashish Raichu. Uh, He said, you know, we met in um, Delhi two times and then we worked together on uh, on youth conferences. On youth conferences and then we got to know each other better and better. But I was introduced to him by his book. I don't remember what the book was because it was taken away by uh, some people from me. And when I opened it, it was black and white and then the name was Ashish Raichur. 
And when he said Ashish Raichur, Raichur is a very familiar name to me because my forefathers have come out of Raichur, but they went and settled in Warangal in, in Telangana state because they were working in railways at that time. I, but I'd never been to Raichur. So I thought, you know, you must have some linking or some kind of link or connection with the Raichur. And so I fell in love with him with his first book. So I just want to confess that. And then later on, he also happens to come to Seva Bharat uh, premises. We have a facility for uh, people to come from all over the world and the nation, all different denominations, churches and missions come there and have their seminars and conferences and retreats there. And I happened to see him ministering to the young people at that time. Whatever it is, I feel that this is a God-given privilege to me to meet such a man of God. I have seen many people in my life, though I'm, I'm not so big or small as an ordinary insignificant person. I have come across many leaders and uh, many other leaders I did not see them. But I haven't come across a person who has such a spiritual integrity. A godly servant, a servant leader, and is always encouraging, motivating, inspiring with his lifestyle. It's not only his messages and his work as a pastor over here or many other training programs, but as, a, as an obedient disciple of Jesus Christ, through his lifestyle, he has attracted me so much. And I think that is the greatest link, I believe, that the Holy Spirit has brought me over here. When he invited me some time back in February or March, I would like to come uh, in April, I think. Uh, it was May 7th or so he was inviting me. No, no, I won't be here at that time. Then why don't you plan it on June 18th? I said, yes. Usually, um, uh, I, we have our own work, so we don't take up assignments outside. Uh, but I felt like, you know, I must go and see this church. I heard about this church. I'm a very poor man. I'm an illiterate for computers, so I don't go through the websites and all that to, you know, uh, see or understand what other people are doing. But it's a word of mouth. You know, by word of mouth, I came to know that All People's Church is one of the vibrant spiritual churches in this uh, city of Bangalore. And Bangalore is not an ordinary city by any means. And... Uh, and the, uh, the quality of his leadership and the quality of faithful believers here are so great that they are not only worshipping the Lord, but they are involved in bringing transformation in the lives of young people and others in the in this city and planted five churches. And when I came to know that, last time I don't know whether he remembers it or not, I sometimes jokingly, I don't know how to joke, how to cut, you know, I'm not a humorous man. But by my foolishness, I make people happy. So, so I make some kind of a comment which will be really foolish. But, you know, people laugh at it. That's what I want. Let me be foolish. So I said, okay, you have five churches. That's fine. Why don't we have a conference for Karnataka for at least 5,000 people? And see that in five years' time, you have five, 100 churches planted. I, I don't know whether you remember it or not. But I still remember it uh, because that was the seed of faith, <laughs> the seed of the Holy Spirit, because Karnataka needs a leadership like, uh, uh, you know, a leadership that is relevant to the present context today. And therefore, I wanted this church to become a blessing to the whole state of Karnataka, though you have a world outreach vision. So I'm not belittling that. Everyone must have a world outlook and a world outreach. That is fine, but we have to start from your home. And as a city, you have all resources with human resource, financial resource, educational, intellectual, technological, all resources are available. And uh, now the state of Karnataka is like a North India in South India. People say that. That means we don't have much work in North India, but God is doing mighty and wonderful things over there. Here also, God is doing in Karnataka. God has raised many partners here who are working on their own. But if you can bring all of them together 
and give them as a people's church. I'm not just talking about Ashish, but as a church, if you can take up that challenge, organize for 5,000 people, say, pretty big job. It's not an ordinary thing to organize anything, even to cook for, you know, two persons or four persons who visit you as guests. It's very difficult for the woman to prepare the food. But 5,000 people, that can be done. Nothing is impossible with God. So, church, that is my first comment on this church, that you got to become a blessing first to the state of Karnataka. Secondly, I do not know what I was going to speak. If the Holy Spirit allows me, I'll speak it. If your hearts are prepared for that, then that will have some meaning. Otherwise, I'll stop and go away from here. Ashish was asking, you are a great preacher and you are doing such a great job. I am not a big theologian. I'm not a big preacher. I'm only a, like a broom, like a stick or like a crowbar, like a spade. You know, as a tool, you know, can be used by anyone. Sometimes I do say that I'm a simple, <laughs> I'm a simple, stupid, dirty donkey, always willing to carry anyone on my back. That was a saying. I always say that. So I, I mean it because of serving, nothing like serving by love. And that's what we were taught, you know. We love the Lord with all our heart and mind and soul. And then we love our neighbors by serving them. So that's what you have been doing. Then I am also motivated to do that. So when he was asking what I should do, that just share your testimony. Well, I'm standing here to share my testimony. How God can use an insignificant person for a mightier things. And we know lots of stories from the Bible about that. You know about King David. He was not a king before he made a, he was made a king. And you know, all Moses, even though out of all his education, experience in a royal palace and all that, he went to serve his father-in-law and tending the sheep. But you know, all of a sudden at the age of 80 years, you know, God called him, hey, Moses, I have not given you this education, these skills and all of that just like that. You got to go and deliver my people from the slavery uh, of uh, Egyptians. Wow. And you know all of that story, how God used them. When Caleb and Joshua, they also attained about eight years of age. And when they were sent out to spy the place of Canaan, which they are going to possess, and all the 12 tribes leaders went there. And among them were these two people. Everybody came with their reports saying that, okay, that's a beautiful place. A lot of, it's a very rich place. A lot of crops, a lot of fruit trees are there. Wow, that's great. But the people are very strong. They're like uh, giants. It's very difficult to overcome them and occupy that land. But contrary to that, Caleb and uh, Joshua comes to Moses and say, we can do that. We can conquer them. And everybody was laughing at them. Hey, what are these two people who conquer? We are 10 people. We said, you know, that is a real report. That's really, it's a factual report they gave. But here is something different. Facts are different. Okay, what you see are different. But when you look at with the spiritual eyes and with the spiritual understanding, you know, you will come out how we can overcome them. And these are the people who said we can overcome them because of our faith in God and because of the promise that he made to us. He made a promise that we possess it. And we have that faith. All that we need to do is obey his command and go. And they did it after 80 years of age. So there is a place in the kingdom of God for a young child of even five years or even four years, even three years. I saw one three years old child reciting you know, memory verses like anything. In the WhatsApp, somebody sent it. I saw one young, girl, young, young boy of about seven, six years. He's preaching the gospel to the people on Christmas and Easter uh, events. And just like any other great speaker, like Billy Graham, usually we quote Billy Graham as a great preacher. So if they were doing it. So nothing is impossible for a child or for an older man. They think that you know, they're retired and they can't do anything, but the potential that God has given to him will never last. It will never decrease. It will go on increasing until we abide with him forever and ever.
And that's, that's the clue that I have in the story that God wants me to present before you. Well, there was a boy who was about around nine years. His father died suddenly with some kind of a strange disease. No doctor could uh, you know, diagnose it properly. Within 25 days, he died. And the boy and the, pair, and the mother of that family was also you know, discussing and uh, sharing together. No, no, this is something done by somebody. Somebody played witchcraft on this man. And his own brothers were against him, and brothers' wives were not uh, Christians, and they were against it, and they never wanted my father to live, and therefore they played some mischief, and then uh, my father, uh, you know, died all of a sudden. And it was that time I was looking for a father, and my mother was a semi-literate, and uh, she knows how to read and write, but she has some skill of uh, uh, doing some uh, sewing and tailoring work, and so she was earning some money. My father had a good business, and a granite business also, and all that was taken over by my uncles, and whatever little things they give, my mother used to take, and it was a uh, very hard time for us, and I had two older sisters and myself, my mother, four of us have to live, and I'm looking for a father. I heard that there was a church uh, very close by to our, to, our, to our house. I never been to that church before. So I walked in the hot sun in 1960, I believe, or 61. Uh, by the time I went, everybody, it was like a church like this. Uh, many children, big, you know, young boys and girls were there inside. All windows and doors are open, but uh, I was unable to get inside of this uh, church building because I was unwelcome. Nobody was caring for me. Nobody's invited me. I never knew anybody there. And therefore, but I was curious to see what was happening. So I was peeping through the windows to see what was happening. I went, you know, back side, front side, you know, two sides. And then I saw many young children were uh, grouping together and some teachers were teaching and children, some children were singing and they were uh, doing some uh, action songs and some people, were, children were doing some handwork or, you know, things like that and enacting some skits. That attracted me so much, I wanted very much to get into it, but I had no courage to get in. So, highly disappointed, I left for home that afternoon in the, in the midsummer, May, Ma, May, and no shoes that time. You know, I had to walk on the dust and the hot sun. But I couldn't sleep that night. And I got up by 5 o'clock, and by 7 o'clock I was ready, and I marched towards the church, which was about 2 kilometers away from our house. By the time I went, the church was closed. The church building was closed. It was locked. Then I was wondering, yesterday there was full of people and everything was open, and today it is all closed. So I was wondering what was happening there. I just sat on the footsteps there, uh, and by the, within half an hour's time, children from all angles you know, thronged together and uh, made up some lines according to their, I think, age groups. And then they were singing some songs and they were praying. At the time, I just went and saw my size. I'm a short man. So I took my size and I stood in one of the lines. Then after the prayer, I walked into that. And that was the primary grade, you know, class, which was a VBS class. I never knew it was a VBS class. That was the first spiritual breakthrough in my life. For the first time, I came to know that Jesus Christ is the Lord. And he's the father for me. And on the ninth day, because I lost already one day, and it was 10 days program, ninth day, and when the teacher asked me, how many of you accept Jesus Christ? I raised two hands very lovingly and said, I accept Jesus Christ without meaning it much. But there was a change. And that program was conducted by three young men who were studying in Usmania University in Hyderabad. They had some scholarship. So they want to do something good for their church. So all the three young boys came. They used that money for conducting that vacation Bible school for 500 children. But that has changed my life. Then we mo I moved with my mother to a different place called Janagan. There was a Baptist mission school. So my mother brought me there. And she got a job in the government as a midwife. So she was touring all the villages all health work, midwifery, so many things she was doing. But I was 
living in the hostel and staying there. And at the age of 12, and there was another development that took place because of my teachers who led me really to Christ at the time and led me to the salvation experience. That's the time I witnessed in water baptism. That was another breakthrough in my life. But immediately after that, there was another one. That was uh, the teacher somehow motivated me. Okay, why don't you just take some of young people and go to nearby villages and teach all that you have learned? So I gathered about 30 young boys and girls from the school. It's a high school. Every Saturday after the school hours were over, we used to go in 12 teams to 12 villages. No Bible, no New Testament, no gospel, no songs book, no shoes, just by walk. And some of the boys used to go to a distant villages, about 12 kilometers away from that. So some teachers used to pay for the rent of the bicycle. So they used to go double sawari. You know double sawari? I think we're all familiar with double sawari. Uh, I don't know now whether people are familiar. So people, you know, to are um, going on the bicycle. Let's just go and then come back by evening, 6 o'clock. And what they were doing there, whatever they learned in the Sunday school or the youth meetings, the same theme, same lessons, same spiritual, um, scripture text, same prayers, same games, same songs or choruses. Just they used to go and teach all the non-Christians and bring them back, all these people, once a year to the school, boarding home, and to have uh, a festival for Christmas time. And these young children from 12 villages to come by bullock carts, nicely decorated with the horns, with painted horns. It was a loving scene. And then my duty as the leader was to do something for them to give some gifts. So I used to go to the town, Jengan town. I used to take my shirt like this and ask them, my children are coming from the villages. Can you give them a Christmas gift? People gave me pencils, rubbers, ribbons, pins, buttons, and uh, uh, some used clothes, all that I used to gather. But I know I used to take the shirt like this. No plastic sacks that time, no, no bags those days, and, uh, which was a difficult you know, times. And as students, we never used to have any money in our pockets and then give them as white gifts to them. They used to demonstrate all that they have learned. In that. That's how I was doing it and finished my high school and then went to college. It was by God's grace I could get some scholarship. So I did my PUC, PU University course. I think it is still there in Karnataka, PUC. Then I went to Hyderabad for my undergraduate and postgraduate studies. But it so happened when I was in the school, I was attached to a, a, a missionary station. Uh, one American couple used to stay in a remote village. In holidays time, I used to go and help them, especially with the children ministry and health work and some social work over there and earn some money and come back to the colleges. But when I was in Hyderabad, uh, the same zeal, I started teaching in the Sunday schools, not only one, but two. I don't know how I got the money, but I have gathered about one or uh, 200 young people together and used to have a rally every month and have someone, some speaker coming and, you know, challenging them for missions. And then take these people, at least not all the people, but selected people, a couple of buses used to hire, and take them to different villages on weekends. I don't know how I got the money for that. Still, I can't guess. And two buses, at least 80 people used to go, and we used to prepare, plan very well, where to go and all that. No. No churches there, no Christian people there. Hardly in one or two places, some illiterate Christians may be there. And I drop them batches by batches there and give them some program, some tracks to some people, and then some are to sing, and some, you have nice electric guitars. But you know, some of the, the city youth had some guitars, not electric, but tabla, dolok, and kanjar, you know kanjar? That is tambourine, tambourine, and some ball, and some tenicoid, you know, rings. All that is to take and play with the children and uh, then go. And I used to go and climb on the walls and take a newspaper and make it like a loudspeaker, you know, and teach them, Jesus Christ is, a, you know, is the Lord of everyone. He will save you from your sins. 
come and accept him, something like that, you know. I was preaching them, and one fellow came and, you know, put his cigar on my feet. So I fell down from that place. And they, was, and they were praying for the sick, and they're playing with the young people, and the women were going, I mean, girls were also there. Um, you know, they're doing all kinds of a ministry. Comfort ministry was very much for the lonely people, old people, they were doing it. And then giving bath to the children. You know, some children, they don't take bath. They don't have any soaps in the villages. So they carry the soaps and they, they take some snow bottles. You know, Afghan snow? I don't know whether you remember that. Afghan snow? Uh, that blue bottle with uh, that snow? And then some powder and all that, some mirrors. So dress them up and ask them to see your face now. So, so nice. See, when you come to Jesus Christ, you'll become like this. You become handsome, beautiful, you know, seems like that, we used to tell them. That was how we were doing. That's all our world at that time. Nobody has taught us anything about missions. Nobody asked us to go, but it is the power of the Holy Spirit which was guiding us at that time without our realization. We were never realizing that, you know, God called us and we are doing it. But, you know, the move was coming from the Holy Spirit. Well, these people used to go and stay in the nights in some village Sometimes we carry our rice and dal and, you know, oil, everything, even chilies, and ask somebody to cook for us. Or, or otherwise, we cook ourselves. Sometimes people used to give, you know, they cut chicken also and give us and stay there. And next day, have some worship with the people by afternoon and go back to Hyderabad. And then by evening, we are at our homes. And next day, you know, oh, everyone will go to their schools or colleges. Some workers used to be there. They used to go to their works. That's how we were doing. And never knowing that out of that, 62 people will come into full-time ministry. And I came to know about, after leaving that place, after 10 years I came to know that 62 people came into the full-time ministry, including me and my wife and my Sunday school students, three of my students. And those are the leaders in those churches now in Hyderabad who are really leading big, big churches with 2,000, 3,000. They're all big leaders. I look very small before them now. And uh, the, uh, the senior pastor of uh, Second Abad Centenary Baptist Church, which has got 5,000 people, Ephraim, was my Sunday school student, and now he's my senior pastor. You know, I go and say, Pastor, pray for me. You know, that's how people have done. And many people have gone abroad. And one fellow, Stephen, was a very good cricket player. He has come down from the... Uh, flight and uh, directly came to my house in Tarnaka and said, uh, Anna, I cannot forget those days, very eventful days. What do you remember? The way that you took me, it took all of us to different places. Now the same vision I got. I'm coming down from Boston every year and conducting youth meetings and sending them to villages. I never believed that. People are in the U.S., in New Zealand, other places, and serving the Lord. So whatever was done in the name of Jesus, even though I was not a perfect, you know, man of God, you know, whatever God has given me, the gifts, I, I use them. And I also encourage them to develop their skills and uh, talents. I used to have all kinds of spiritual activities, including cricket and games, and present them rolling shields, two years, two years competitions, very competitive spirit. We need to, we used to develop. But anyway, that was one chapter, how the young people I was associated with. And then I finished my college. I went abroad and I was in the UN World building uh, one day because I wanted to see Security Council and General Assembly there. Because I acted like MC Chakla, the then um, Education Minister of our uh, uh, Government of India. And in a UN World Day, I performed you know, a speech. So I wanted to do that speech. So I went to the podium there. There was no congregation, so I was speaking like MC Chagla. Then security council, I was not allowed. I went to the library, some floor, and then stayed there till 4 o'clock. I didn't have money. I purchased one flag, UNW flag, and I presented it to my mentor. Uh, on the third day, you know, after that, you know, I returned home. Many people asked me to stay back in the States, but uh, I couldn't. I represented at a world conference at their place. Very young. I was 19 years old at that time. But God's plans were different. I was trying to discover as I was journeying with him. That is how God was showing me. Well, we came and uh, God gave me a job. I was teaching in a college job, lucrative, UGC scales. 
that time 22,000 basic. That was a very big thing. And then um, uh, greening pen, gazetted officer can sign many certificates. All that was there. But uh, my heart was again with this work. Though I was doing that, I used to come and conduct these activities and married in 1989 uh, to Kamala. She was my classmate. And she has studied better than me. She's actually a doctorate. She did her PhD in uh, Madras University in economics and education. Uh, mine is only a donated doctorate. It is not a real PhD. Because nobody wanted to take me. I wanted to go and do my teaching. And they were telling, you don't need any research. You don't need any PhD. And then all of a sudden, World Missions Incorporated from California came forward for my work at the age of 40 they have presented me, to my surprise, a doctorate. I did not use it for one year. Then my, some professor scolded me. You're at the age of 40, you got it. You must be grateful to God and use it, they said. Then since then, I was using it. Otherwise, I, I was not for that. Well, we married, and God's purpose was something different. Again, another spiritual breakthrough here. Third day, our, our honeymoon was sweeping a village called Pemberthi, Along with, along with the ambassador to uh, the government of Saudi Arabia, Zahir Ahmed, and then the district officials and all that. We had a big camp, leveling the grounds and cutting the bushes, conducting some health program. That was a honeymoon. On the 10th day, we both happened to go to the same village where I used to work with these missionaries in summertime. We were challenged to go and serve there. We said we'll go for three months and see. In a small room, 30, a three by four place, that was our room. And three by three was our toilet and our uh, and bathroom and everything. Uh, you know, that's where we used to have a mat and slept with a, with a trunk full of our clothes. And then adapt to 125 villages. You name any poverty alleviation program that government of India has introduced, we were the first people in Warangal district to take up and do them successfully. So we had very good favor from the government. Never they have stopped my payments. They never they had any bad remark about us, even though there was a lot of opposition for Christians doing that kind of a work. But there, uh, with all kinds of health, education, evangelism, church planting, helping um, uh, very specially helping the poorer people, skill developments, even in nutrition. So many things were happening, but somehow God did not allow us, sent us back, and we went to, I went to college. And Kamala, before my marriage, she was a college lecturer, but because of me, she came with me. And in the village, because she was a woman, she was given 400 rupees, and because I was a man, I was given 500 rupees. My mother never believed, because you were earning 22,000 basic, how come you come for 500 and 400? That's how another spiritual breakthrough. We never knew that that will happen. Well, God has placed in our hearts and uh, that burden, we did it. And then after one year's time, you know, God moved us to Chennai. There from with, with Mission India and India Bible Literature. Uh, we were working with that. And then we crisscrossed the whole country, giving partnerships programs to people training them for church plant. We are not church planters. We are not theologians that time. We are just mere lay leaders. But all our Christian education, theological education has come because of boarding home, Christian high school, and because of the ministries and the association with the missionaries. That's all. And we were heading that and started with 20 people, then going around all the uh, places in different parts of India, right from Myanmar border, to here in um, Gandhi Dam, Kashmir, to Kanyakumari, all those places, staying for a week in every place, one, one week, and training people. At that time, God gave us a vision to bring these missions together. All people who are working in different places were from South, Kerala and uh, Tamil Nadu. And because they received God's call for, uh, for Great Commission work, they left their places, families, everything, set out to these North Indian places, you know, which are like, you know, foreign places. India is a nation of nations with so many languages, cultures, habits. Very difficult for anyone to work. But they were working, and that was the second 
actually evangelical breakthrough in our country first was overseas ministries. Overseas people came and spread the gospel in our country. St. Thomas came like that. He planted seven churches. Okay? And then, then it all was growing. And when William Carey came and the Bible was translated into different Indian languages, then people were able to take it and become disciples and preach the gospel. That's how the God's kingdom was being extended in our country. But 1975, 76, government of India has banned all the missionaries, overseas missionaries, and they've never given new visas to them. So they all left. But God raised these people to go to these places and serve them. That was the sovereign will of God. That was a second breakthrough in our country for evangelical work. Then God already placed them here and there. So we brought them together in partnerships so that we can see that India is transformed for Christ. God has been using me and Kamala. We only have two options. Either you go and do this. If you cannot go, send someone. I have 20,000 plus grassroots workers 500 staff working in seven stations, uh, operating from seven stations like Delhi, Bombay, Calcutta, Gauhati, Bhopal, Hyderabad, and Chennai. They're all together 500. They train people, they prepare curriculum materials, tools, and then they will give oversight, they evaluate, all that kind of work they do. But grassroots workers are 20,000 plus. It's a huge work. And that's the reason I want to encourage the churches, either you go, and get involved, engaged in the work of the gospel and bring honor and glory to God and see that our beautiful land of India is transformed for Christ in our lifetime, in our generation. God bless you. Thank you very much. So thank you so much, Dr. Chiranjivi. And uh, we are, uh, I mean, one thing that really impressed me is the strategies that you have uh, and the way you're working, you know, with strategy, uh, reaching our nation. And I think as a church, uh, we also need to think strategically how we can impact our own city and cities across our nation. Amen? Let's rise to our feet. Now, uh, I know today is uh, Father's Day. And uh, this morning, I also want to welcome... Um, Dr. Ashish Naidu, he's actually my own cousin. Ashish, come on up. <laughs> and he has just the same name. He's, he's an associate professor of theology at uh, Talbot uh, Biola University uh, uh, based in California. And he just happened to visit the same day. So I thought, you know, just take a moment to uh, greet him, welcome him. And, you know, today's Father's Day. So Ashish, I'll ask you to pray for all the fathers. Yeah, so... Uh, let's, uh, he's going to pray over us, pray for all the fathers, just bless us, and uh, then we will uh, close and dismiss. So, fathers, God bless you. We're going to just pray for you, and ask you to just lead us in prayer. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, how we praise and thank you for reminding us through our brother here, Dr. Chiranjeevi, the need that there is in India, and for the way the gospel is being preached in every town and city and village. We thank you, Lord, for your Holy Spirit who is moving in this country and working to bring glory to your name. Help us, Lord, to partner in the gospel. Churches, Bible colleges, institutes, missions, organizations, help us all to work together so that the gospel might reach everyone. And today, Lord, in a very special way, we come before you asking for your blessing upon the fathers of this church here, All People's Church. We thank you, Lord, for the way you've blessed us and the privilege you've given us and the responsibility that you've given us to serve as fathers. It's truly a, a, a vital role that we play as leaders of our families, as high priests of our families. And help us, Lord, to do what you've called us to do. Equip us by your grace, enable us by your power, and use us as instruments so that your name might be glorified. To this end, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so much. So we're just going to close. Now, if those of you who need prayer, ministry, we'll be available to uh, pray with you. Uh, let's just close. Father, we just thank you so much for this time.
And I just pronounce your blessing, Father, upon your people. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, our Father, and the sweet fellowship of his Holy Spirit be with each of us always. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Thank you for being here this morning. Have a great Sunday. See you again. We trust that this message was a blessing to you. We'd love to hear from you. You can email us at contact at apcwo.org. Also visit our website, apcwo.org, for additional resources. Thank you for listening and God bless you.